Well, God bless you for being here today, members and friends and guests alike. Matthew chapter 12, please, if you would. Matthew chapter 12. Well, happy Harvest Sunday. Look forward to taking the harvest offering. Obviously, we will be gathering that both today and next week for our missionaries. I have a map out uh, with pins in it. Of I believe that's most of the missionaries that we support financially. And, um, of course, support them through the general offerings of the church. But then the harvest offering, a special offering for them around the holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And, and has been a great blessing to our missionaries for uh, a good long time. And so we pray that uh, they be blessed today and that you be prepared as you're able uh, to give. We seek to seek first our Father's kingdom together and prioritize His work with our finances. And we give extra, of course, uh, to encourage their hearts and their life's work for Him. But I pray that as you are able, you willingly give. Uh, the Apostle Paul said in Second Corinthians chapter 9, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully, every man according as he purposeth in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. He's going to continually meet your needs so you can continue to be a blessing to others, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. And our Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew 6, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So I pray your heart is full of liberality this Harvest Sunday and desire to seek first the kingdom of God. We come to an interesting snapshot of Jesus' life. And it should fit very nicely with this special day, but it may shock some modern American sensibilities about life a bit. However, the truth Jesus introduced here is consistent throughout the entire New Testament. So I've been praying for all of us to take it to heart. And I've been praying for all of us to live it with passion. So I'll remind you, in Matthew 12, of course, you have the the confrontation between the Pharisees and Jesus. And Jesus has just been going about doing good, doing what he, as the Son of Man, the Lord of the Sabbath day, says is lawful, doing well, loving his disciples and healing people. And even when the Pharisees were plotting how they might destroy him, he still was going about and ministering to the multitudes. And then from verses 25 through 45, as we saw last week, Jesus answered their accusation. And all of this seemed to take place, though, in a house. Now, we know he was in the synagogue when he healed the man with a withered hand. But when he moved from there and ministered to the multitudes, it seems like the conversation that we studied last week happened in a house. You say, why do you say that? Well, verse 46 kind of gives us a hint at that. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, I'm assuming someone within the house, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? Now Jesus wasn't clueless like the bird Dr. Seuss wrote about. Are you my mother? He knew. He was asking a question to make a point. Verse 49 and he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. The other day I'd come home and Emmy was trying to get my attention while Elizabeth and I were having a moment. Uh, I think I had her in an embrace and telling her how pretty she was. I think it was before church or something, and she had curled her hair and was all dressed up, of course. Yet, Emmy over here is saying something, and by the seventh time she said it, she didn't say it. She screamed it. 
So she had escalated up to there. And so finally, you know, calmed her, said, hey, we don't do that in this house. Um, Asked her what she said. And she said, mommy curled my hair. And the next thing she says was, I'm happy now. (laughs) Emmy just wanted my attention. And that's family for you, right? Well, in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus' family wanted his attention. But Jesus didn't give them the time of day. Why didn't he? We'll seek to answer that question and unpack what the answer has to do with us. Our title this morning is, This is Family. This is Family. I've asked Mr. J. Thomas if you would please ask a blessing for this morning. Amen. Thank you. Well, Harvest Sunday is awesome because harvest is. Now, I know we sure appreciate fall, but I guarantee we don't appreciate it as much as farmers do. My grandfather, Grandpa Springer, was a farmer. uh, My family has a picture of him out on the tractor during harvest time with the wagon being pulled behind it. It's just a good picture. He's a good-looking farmer. And my dad, when we moved to Illinois, in rural Illinois, um, there in the Midwest, uh, for a few years through junior high and high school, dad would like to go and help as long as grandpa was alive to harvest. And then after that, he'd help his cousin uh, who harvested grandpa's land. Um, But Harvest Sunday certainly means something to harvesters. And Harvest Sunday focuses here for us On the harvest of souls, I have a letter this morning, and I love reading the letters of our missionaries, and um, we try to keep the most current missionary that highlighted out in the foyer so you can check it out, Um, but I especially love ones that you can tell their heart is just in the work, their hearts in the work. They want to see people saved, they want to see people baptized, they want to see churches established and those churches turned over to national pastors so they can move on and do that somewhere else, and their hearts in that. And here, I I really love reading from Danny Flowers. He's a missionary in France, and Danny is there with his wife Janice, and they have four children there with them, Lydia and Kara and Lincoln and Grant. And in the August letter, they have pictures of some young people here, and three of them recently came to faith in Christ. One's name is Nietzsche, or it's a Z, I'm assuming, it's not a double Z like pizza, but I'm just assuming, okay? So Nietzsche and Maxime, he's a young man, um, I guess kind of Maximus maybe or something like that, and then Eunice. And these three individuals got saved. And thinking about them, it reminds me of what Paul said to the church at Ephesus, that I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. These people, though they are strange to us, aren't strangers anymore, but they are fellow citizens with the saints and are of the household of God. We're family with them. Nietzsche and Eunice, Eunice and Maxime, they're our sisters and our brother. I have a $20 bill in my pocket this morning, and your, your dollars that you give to the general fund of Emmanuel Baptist Church goes to regularly supporting missionaries like Daniel Flowers, and, and your giving to the harvest offering, it goes to bless and encourage a man's heart, and encourage a family, lets a family have Christmas presents, so they can enjoy life, life, even in a place where they're thousands of miles away from home and continue in the work. Their hearts and the joy of their hearts matter if they're going to continue. And your dollars and your prayers are a big part of seeing new siblings like these three be added to the family. And this happens not just in one spot on earth, not just in Charleville, Misère, France, but it happens all over the world as we see. We have the map there, and there are missionaries scattered all over the world seeking to see people saved and be born again, become a part of the family of God. And the cool thing about a day like today, and the cool thing about the regular giving to Emmanuel Baptist Church is we get to have a part in growing the family. We get to have a part in that, and we get to have a hand in the harvest. And you know Jesus' passion for us. You know what makes his heart beat? That we would make disciples of all nations and generations by gathering as the church and growing as disciples and going with the gospel. That is his heart, and it's his desire that Emmanuel Baptist Church thrives here 
in the harvest. I'm talking about in Coweta County. He wants us to thrive in the harvest. And his longings that Emmanuel Baptist Church sends more harvesters out there. He wants to send maybe you. His passion is like a fire. It's campfire season. It's fireplace season. And his passion is like a fire that we as a church, we as a believer, we either kindle it or we quench it. And I'm realizing as an American pastor that nothing quenches that fire more than divided attention. Nothing puts a damper on the do do like professing Christians who are touch and go. Nothing is a rebirth control in the family of God like professing family members living for themselves. I'm just saying that this day reminds us of a great opportunity, but it also challenges us to our core. What are we living for? There's so much to live for in America. I mean, so much. Thank God for our freedom. But it's so much, in fact, that we as believers often do very little living. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And yet the more we give ourselves to the fast pace of American living with American family and our American sports and hobbies and obsessions, American this and that, the less it seems we actually live. The more our attention is on the things of this life, the less our attention seems to be on eternal life. Now, I didn't say any of those things is sinful just questioning our attention this morning. God expects us to rise above the status quo. He expects us to recognize what it means to be a disciple of his dear son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He, our father expects us to live out what it means to be his children, to be his family. Now, by Matthew chapter 12, it had been a long time since Jesus had been around his family. And we're talking about his earthly family. Matthew recorded that Jesus was born of Mary by the Holy Ghost. And Joseph and Mary raised Jesus in Nazareth. But when Jesus, of course, was of age, we read about in Matthew chapter 4, he left Nazareth for Capernaum. And Jesus was consumed with his father's work. And we could get into that and rehash some of that. How he traveled all over Galilee. And even though he didn't have a place to call home, a place to lay his head, as he's healing thousands and preaching to thousands, his heart beating for the lost sheep of Israel, he spent evenings over supper with sinners. He spent countless hours with his disciples. Yet we know that he had not been back to Nazareth yet. In fact, he wouldn't return until the end of chapter 13, which we'll eventually get to, of course. But by Matthew chapter 12, you get this picture of his life here in this snippet. And it's in a crowded house. A crowded house. We about had a crowded house last night. If it wasn't for the weather was just right, we about had 30-some people and about 10 of those little soccer kids in our house. We had a soccer get-together. Jack's soccer team came over. And I would imagine a crowded house. But you, you picture this crowded house. You picture a crowded house. A lot going on. Bustling activity. All this stuff. This is Jesus' life. Busy as usual. Ministering to the multitudes. Just gentle. With the multitudes, he was gentle and loving and kind. But also, it was full of mounting pressure with the religious leaders. You say, this, talks about, this sounds like a family reunion. Some ministry going on over here, but then you got old crank pots over here. Someone's got to go to toe, toe to toe with. And that's what was going on in this crowded house in Matthew t- chapter 12. But I want you to notice something very interesting. His family wasn't there with him. Jesus was in the middle of his conversation with the Pharisees when it says, Behold, so here's the crowded house. Behold, his mother and brothers stood without. We know from chapter 13, verse 55, they're given some of the names. Of course, we know his mother was Mary. And then his half-brothers, he lists them out, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. And they're, they're standing without. They're not in the house. They're not in the middle of his conversation. They're not in the middle of his life. But they really wanted to talk to him. I mean, it had evidently been a while since they had. He'd been away from home. And they really wanted to speak to him. But it's kind of strange because you read verse 46. And then Jesus did nothing. 
You go back to verse 14 of chapter 12 and you see how the Pharisees, his enemies, were plotting how they might destroy him. And then verse 15, it says Jesus knew it and withdrew himself and healed those people. You go to verse 24 and you see his Pharisees, his enemies, again, accusing him of casting out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And then verse 25, Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, but verse 46, you have his mother and his brethren standing without desiring to speak to him, then Jesus said and did nothing. And then one even tried to get his attention for them in verse 47. It's like they're out there, Jesus is here in the crowded house, and they're out on the outside trying to find a way in, and they can't get in. There's so many people in there, in on his life. His disciples were there too. There's just a bunch of people, his enemies, people that loved him, and his disciples, and, and they're trying to get in. And someone over here who's in the house pipes up, hey, hey, I think I see your family out there, and they really want to talk to you. Hey, behold! Look out there, Jesus. Your family wants to talk to you. And it's ironic because Jesus' attention was on his family. And I say ironic because he responded to the man. He did not respond to his family out there. He did not leave what he was doing to go out and get them. He didn't say, tell someone, hey, someone go, go get them and bring them in. Let me see what they want. No, he asked the man a question, verse 48. Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? You can just see the man thinking, say what? <laughs> what do you mean by that? Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? Well, they're standing outside and they really want to talk. Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? Have you, have, have you forgotten who your family is, Jesus? I mean, have you totally written off your upbringing? Do you remember who you are? Who thinks Jesus knew full well who he was? Who are my mother and who are my brethren? And he's sitting there or standing there. And, and this man's saying, your mother and your brethren are standing out and they want to talk to you. And Jesus says, who are my ma mother and my brethren? And he does this. Behold. Behold my mother and my brethren. He stretched forth his hands toward his disciples. These fishers from Galilee, this tax collector from Capernaum, these other seven guys from all across the spectrum, and likely many other disciples too. He stretched forth his hands toward his disciples and he says, Behold my mother and my brethren. Jesus had his attention on his family. I mean, do we got to run through the beholds? Here's his family out here, his earthly family, by birth. That's his mother, the, the, the woman, the lady who gave birth to him, and she wants to see him, and her sons, her other sons by Joseph want to see him. And they're saying, behold, behold, they're desiring to see him. They want his attention. And then one over here is thinking, hey, shouldn't, it, shouldn't they have your attention? Shouldn't they have your attention? And Jesus says, hey, I'll show you what has my attention, and I ought to have your attention too. His disciples were his mother and brothers. His disciples were his family. That's revolutionary. That's a different take. You say, why would Jesus say anything like that? Well, he told the man why in verse 50. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. Jesus' disciples were his family because they did the will of his Father in heaven. They had repented and believed on him. On the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount, well, it came out of his mouth, the Sermon on the Mount, okay, you can go back and look. He repeatedly told the disciples this, Your Father, let your light so shine on earth that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. He goes through all those things he tells them to do and tells them to be and reconcile and be faithful in marriage and be honest and love your enemies. Why? Be therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. You go through chapter 6, he talks about fasting and praying and, and, and almsgiving, and he says, don't do it to be seen of men, but do it for your Father's eyes in secret, because your Father rewardeth openly. And at the end of chapter 6, when he's talking about not worrying, not being anxious about what are we going to eat and what are we going to wear. Why? Because verse 32, after all these things did the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. See, Jesus' Father in heaven was his disciples' Father. And his Father was their Father because they did his will. The disciples of Jesus were Jesus' family. You see, here's Jesus in this crowded house. Here's this man out here. Look at your family. And Jesus is saying, 
Look at my family. Your family's out there and they want your attention. And Jesus says, my family's right here. And Jesus responded to the one desiring him, behold your family by desiring him. Behold my family. Now it's interesting because aside from a mention of Mary and the boys in chapter 13, verse 55, they don't seem to pop up the rest of Matthew. In fact, the one time they might have been mentioned is interesting. I want to show you real quick. Hold your place in Matthew 12 and go over to Matthew chapter 27. This might be a mention of his mother and his brethren. Chapter 27, verse 55, he had just died. He had just cried with a loud voice and yielded up the ghost. Verse 55 says, And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. Now, I could be wrong. I don't, I'm not going to guarantee anything right here. But this might be a mention of Jesus' mother Mary. And verse 56, not Mary Magdalene, but Mary the mother of James and Joseph. We know on other occasions, in other gospels, that Mary was there at the crucifixion. In fact, in fact, John records that Jesus said, right before he dies, he says to the disciple whom, whom Jesus, whom he loved, son, behold thy mother, and woman, behold thy son. So we know that Mary was there. But, but could this be Mary? I, I, I don't know for sure. All I know is that when you go back to Matthew chapter 13 and verse 55 where it talks about uh, here, here, here's the, the son of uh, the, the carpenter here in Nazareth and his mother's name Mary. And is it his brother's name, what, what was it? James and Joseph. Could it be a coincidence that there's another Mary with a son named James and Joseph? It could very well be. I'm not trying to drag this out. I, I'm not trying to drag out a point that I don't, I don't know for sure. But if that was Mary, and if that was James, and that was Joseph, why would it even identify Mary, in that case, as Jesus' mother? Well, perhaps the verse preceding this will give a clue. Look at that. Now, when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the what? Son of God. See, Jesus' identity, his life, his family was wrapped up in his father in heaven. And if Matthew was clear about anything, it's this. This is family. What's family? What's family for Jesus? And now it's important to see this because a lot of things desire our attention, even good things. Family is a good thing. But as a disciple of Jesus Christ, what does our family mean to us? What's that balance? What's family for Jesus? Well, we read it back in Matthew 12. Whosoever shall do the will of my Father in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. What's the Father's will? Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you're here today and you're not a born again, you're not part of the family of God, you haven't believed the gospel, you need to do the Father's will and turn from you and turn from your sin and turn to Christ and you can be born again. And become a part of the family of God. What else is the Father's will? Get baptized, watch this, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And then be taught what Jesus taught his disciples. Well, what are those things? It's the family rules. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Try this. If thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Try this. Forgive your brother 70 times 7. Try this. Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your servant. In other words, doing the will of Jesus' Father is, is as simple as 1 John chapter 3, verse 23, that says that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. We should be added to His family through His Son. Faith in His Son, and once added to His family, we should love His family like his son. And that family love 
is what Jesus intended to show the world that the Father sent the Son and loved them as much as he loved the Son. You don't believe me? Read John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. That crowded house is a vivid, living illustration of what family is. Jesus with his disciples, loving people. That's doing the will of the Father. That is family. The New Testament evidence is that this is so. In Acts, remember, the family of God grew as people believed. And those people were baptized and added to churches. Churches that sprang up all over the world. First at Jerusalem, and then there were churches in Samaria, and then in churches in Antioch, and all over the world. Paul wrote to many of those churches and pastors. Do you remember his customary greeting? Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He spoke a lot about living life as the sons of God, saying something, things like, you remember this, letting brotherly love continue. Peter got in on the action too, writing to believers, if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons, doesn't matter who you are, he judgeth according to every man's work. If you call on the Father, pass the time of your sojourning, your short trip on this earth, pass that time in fear. How do you do that? Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned, pure, real, genuine, authentic, sincere love of the brethren. See that ye love one another. With a pure heart fervently. We could go on. I'm just saying, this is family. Disciples of Jesus doing the Father's will together. Life in the crowded house. This is Jesus' family. With millions of things vying for our attention daily. Jesus wants our attention on his family. Jesus wants our attention on his family. You may stand without the house where Jesus is and have never become a part of the family because you have not believed the gospel. You may be in a church building today, gathered with the church, but if you have not repented and believed on Jesus, you stand without that house and you are not part of the family of God. You are of your father, the devil, the prince of the power of this world. You may have been born again, but practically speaking, you may stand without the house because you've never chosen to identify like a wedding ring identifies a man and a woman together. You have never chosen to identify with the family by being publicly baptized to identify with a family. You may be saved and baptized, but stand without the house because your life is not committed to Jesus. And when I, when I mean, when I, what I say, what I mean when I say that, your life is not committed to his disciples. Where would you find them at? Where would you find a manifestation of the family of God on planet earth? What kind of group of people gets together to focus on Jesus and love one another? So that love can be spilled out in the world. Well, you read the New Testament and you see a church. And you may very well be a part of the family of God. You may very well be a child of God. But you may be standing outside of where Jesus is and what he identifies his family. You may look more like a step cousin. You're related. But because of your faithfulness or lack thereof to Jesus and his disciples and a commitment there, you look more like a second cousin who the family sees sometime around family reunion, but not a brother or sister in Christ. This is family. Don't stand without Jesus' family. Get in the house. Gather with that church. We, we call it the house of God. And we know what we're talking about. That, that the people's the church. But we meet on this sacred ground. where This is the house of God. Gather with that church. Go with the, to the house of God. Grow as a child of God. By being a disciple who loves one another as Jesus does. So then you can go. You have something in your heart. You have family love welling up in your life. The, the kids that come from broken homes. From shattered homes. They go and they... they 
they're either reverting to themselves and deal with that way and, and get depressed and, 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 and down or they become quite a bully. They deal with it a number of ways. But the problem is there is something broken in the home. Well, listen, God intends for this family, this church to be healthy and have life. And if, if you want to live the rest of your life broken with all your issues, you, more power to you. But if you will commit yourself to the family of God, you can find to a family of God who is loving one another who is serving one another, who is there for one another, who's got each other's back, that will heal the wounds and mend the hurts and fill you with such love that even though this family's kind of imperfect, and yeah, we've got kind of some strange brothers, if you know what I'm saying. You know, the gospel light attracts some strange bugs. All right, you say, I'm looking at a strange bug. Well, I might be too, okay? And even though we have our faults, we love each other, and God is doing a work here and our lives together, and with that, you can then go into a world, just be a normal person and love normal normal people just like you, like Jesus intended for you to do. You know, I appreciate the efforts of groups like Focus on the Family, but you don't have to neglect or lose your family to focus on Jesus' family. You don't have to neglect or lose your earthly family to focus on Jesus' family. Paul told fathers, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Can we assume those fathers were part of the church Paul wrote to in Ephesus? And that upbringing would be centered in following Jesus with other disciples in one of his churches? Should we have balance in life? Sure. Should we have family time? Please do. It's a lot of fun. For us, it can get kind of nuts. But should we put family before Jesus in his church? That is not a New Testament idea. And I'm all for balance in life. As a pastor, I seek to practice that. This church is Jesus' bride, not mine. That's my bride. And sometimes I need to just put the phone, take the phone off the hook for you. I was about to say old timers. I don't know what else to say. Sorry. Take the phone off the hook and go love my bride and not worry about the issues of Jesus' bride. Are you with me? Sometimes we just need to focus on, on the disciples God has put in our breadbasket in our home and loving them. I'm for that. I've got to learn that. But there is nowhere in the New Testament that you find anything else, even family, is supposed to come before you following Jesus. You say, well, well I, I don't believe you. Okay, how about this? If any man would like to follow me and he doesn't hate his father, his mother, his brother, his sister. He wasn't saying being caustic. His law is a law of love. But unless, if your love for Jesus compared to your love for family doesn't make like that, make that look like hate, then you may not love Jesus like you esteem to. Loving Jesus and thus his church, his family. It ought to be your first love. Well, my family's more important. I'm glad your family's important. But are you a disciple of Jesus Christ if you are more committed to something else than him and his disciples? I'm not questioning your salvation. I'm questioning, are you living like you're a part of the family of God? I'm committed to the universal church. Well, anymore, that seems to be more of an excuse to not be committed to a visible local body than it actually is a statement of sincere love for Jesus and his disciples. The universal church allows people to do whatever they want and not actually be committed to the very singular command Jesus has given us to love one another as disciples. If I'm part of the universal church, if I'm part of this mystical thing out here, then I can float from this church to this church to this church, and if my feelings get hurt, I can float, 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 and never commit to loving other disciples like Jesus loves me. And when I stand before Jesus Christ... This is what I'll be held accountable for, that I love other disciples. Look at it this way. I married one woman, and I'm committed to one woman for the rest of my life. What if my mindset was, well, as long as if I just marry one woman at a, a time, divorce is okay, and I can hop from here to here to here, and God will only hold me accountable for how I love this one, and then how I love this one, and then how I love this one, and then how I love this. I'm not trying to unpack a can of worms. Just follow the illustration. And then I love this one, and then I love this one. No, Jesus is going to hold me accountable for my love for her. But if I'm always seeking to hop around, 
Are you following what I'm saying? If I'm always seeking to hop around and I'm not committed, invested in one, Jesus is going to hold me accountable for how I loved and poured my life into this. This is family. Well, how are you trying to raise a Christian family then? Well, we love our kids and we want them to know that, but we love Jesus Christ more than we love them. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my kids, want to spend time with them, but she's going to be around longer than what they will. And so if I get messed up in my priorities and love them and spend more time with them than I do her, I might hurt the relationship. And so we might raise them well and get them out of the house. They might love me, but I'll end up like Michael Landon and have a failed marriage and a failed marriage and a failed marriage if I don't invest into her. This is family. I love my kids, but I cannot love them more than I love her. I love my family, but I cannot love them more than I love Jesus because there is coming a day the one who gave me the breath I have will hold me accountable with the life he has given me. And while I love my family, and and a career may be important, and marriage even is very important, if I prioritize anything else outside of Jesus, over Jesus, I will give an account for that before Jesus. This is family. Why all this on Harvest Sunday? Well, Harvest Sunday is at the heart of who we are at Emmanuel Baptist Church. And this is what we do. We support brothers and sisters in Christ to go around the world with the gospel to see people become a part of the family. We support them financially and prayerfully. We support our family to grow the family through churches everywhere. We're trying to crowd the house. If you're committed to the harvest of souls worldwide financially. Let me ask you a question. How does Jesus intend for the harvest to happen? How does he intend to crowd the house? The world sees the Father's love in disciples who love one another as Jesus loved them. That's how he crowds the house. Wouldn't it make sense for you, one who is moved by the need of the world and committing with their finances to seeing the world harvested by the love of the Father, wouldn't it make sense? Is it reasonable to you to multiply that harvest by committing your life to that house, to other disciples of Jesus Christ? Don't you want to be a part of one of the success stories of one of Jesus' churches just dumping the love of God out on the world? This applies, this applies to everybody across the board. You're a member of Emmanuel Baptist Church? Church should be your life. And I'm not just saying just, just when we gather here on this campus, on these buildings. I'm saying your brothers and sisters in Christ, they should be the most important group of people in the world to you. What will that take for, to have that success story, that successful family story? What will that take? It'll take this. Behold my family. And if we do that now, one day when Revelation chapter 5 is unfolding in front of our eyes and we see millions of people, we can better say with a clear conscience, knowing we've been a part of it, we can better say as we stretch out our arms toward all the saints of God, (laughs) Behold my family. This is family. Please bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, we're grateful for your love and grace and your son. And we ask you to help us to rise above the status quo of even Christianity in this day and time and deeply love and commit to the family of God and a local church. God, we cannot make disciples if we're not being disciples. And I pray that every one of us would have a part in that very best way that we can. God, please give us wisdom and grace. Work as you see fit now in Jesus' name, amen. Please remain with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Richard's gonna begin to sing. If you haven't been harvested, if you haven't believed the gospel, today would be a great day.
need to talk or hear, pray with you. If you would look up this way, thank you for your attention to the Word of God today. And I uh, just pray that God would bless you and give you strength and uh, that you would be committed to His family, committed to His work. And this is a family of love and grace and forgiveness. And I must say, sometimes in the heat of the moment, you get a little passionate, maybe even use some illustrations that I haven't thought through. Um, so I mean to give you love and grace in your situations of life. Um, but we do care about you. We care about God's work and seeing it done around the world. And I encourage you to be a part of that and I pray that uh, we would be ready. To